bingo. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're a little delayed here. That has to do with me, gang. But uh, I want to thank everyone who is watching. We have a bunch of people on Zoom. It's fantastic. Thank you. And um, those who are joining on Facebook already, that's fantastic. Thank you. So I'll mention this again, but if you have any questions for Gary, just type them in the Q&A or the chat box on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. I'll be monitoring these. But um, the, my uh, guest today is uh, uh, an incredible musician, somebody who I, I got to see you a couple times. Um, it's been a long, long time, but when I saw you, it was highly impactful. And um, as a matter of fact, the first time I saw you was in Skinny Atlas, New York, near the Finger Lakes at the top of a lake at the old stone mill. And I rode my bicycle over because I, it was 1975, I think, and I was 14. I didn't have a license and my parents were busy. And it's like, I'm going to see Stan Kenton's band. So I did. And you were there. And so without further ado, though, my, my guest is Mr. Gary Hobbs. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, good to see you, man. I, oh, mom is on. Hey, mom, what's up? Remember that <laughs> night I rode my bicycle over to Skinny Atlas to see Stan? <laughs> the drummer. Yeah, we had, uh, I'd seen, you know, that fall, the restaurant brought in a lot of bands, like uh, Buddy was there. Saw Buddy with my dad. Um, or maybe it was the next year. Uh, but I saw Peter there with Maynard. And so I'd seen Peter with Stan. And then, I, you know, Stan was coming in. It's like, I got to go because big bands were really are and were a very important part of my life. Um, and thankfully, my parents were really into all those groups. Stan being my mom's favorite, right, mom? <laughs> she has a picture of him in, his, in her wallet. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's cool. But, uh, yeah, so how are you doing, man? How's everything in... Uh, Washington, a little snowy. It's sno yeah, it's snowy right now. We've got about a foot of snow here, and uh, I think it's going to keep going for a while. It's, it's a little abnormal, but uh, since we don't have much of a infra infrastructure to take care of it, as you know, snow plows and I see. the things you have in the east, uh, everybody just kind of sits home and just goes out on foot. So it's not that bad of a deal. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we were talking uh, before we went live here on Facebook. I've been to 43 states and Washington is not one of them, but it was in Portland. So that's pretty close to you. Yeah. So I remember hiking up or running. I was running through the city and I, there's like a volcano there, like Mount something. It's not a Mount St. Mount St. Helens. Uh, not that one. It's actually in the city of Portland. Oh, oh, that's uh, Council does, Crest. Yes. And, uh, you know, not an active volcano where I got to run and I could see, I think it was a Mount uh, Olympus or no. Mount Hood? Yeah, that's the one. Right. Is, 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 there the also a, is there a Mount Rainier too? That's up by Seattle. There, There's a whole bunch, like right around here. Like if I go ride my bike from my house, I can see uh, four mountains. I can see Mount Hood, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams and the tip of uh, Mount Rainier, and sometimes oh. actually the tip of uh, Mount Jefferson, which is quite a way south. But uh, yeah, we're right on the Cascade Mountain Range. See, that's cool. Yeah, the, the Mount Hood, seeing that was just, you know, it looks closer than it is. Absolutely. Course, like all mountains do. So anyways, Gary, man, I, um, I it's really good to have you here. Um, you know, I've been following you for a long time. Then we connected on Facebook. So um, I, I just wanted to maybe start by digging back, if you don't mind, a little back into history. Uh, so I saw you with Kenton. You're, but are you originally from the Northwest? Yeah, I actually, the house we live in now is one block north of where I grew up. Oh, cool. So my daughter, uh, who's like uh, 41 now, she... Uh, Went to the same grade school, same junior high. She's a choir director at the church about a block from here. Oh, so um, I, I love that part. Of that. The reason I'm really glad I moved back to the area just because of all this we have here. That's great. That's great. Um, so 
how did you get into drums and music? Let's stay with just music in general. And then what was that pathway? Well, you know, I, I was a late comer as far as playing music. I always uh, enjoyed listening to it, you know, as in the music of my time and my peers, you know, a lot of, uh, well, I, I grew up in the fifties uh, and sixties. So that music socially was part of my fabric. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was, it was a unique thing in my family that my grandfather and my dad uh, were both drummers. I never mm -hmm. met my grandfather, but the first drums I ever played on were his drums, for example. And um, I uh, was always hearing music in my house. My dad perpetually played a lot of big band stuff and, and, and smaller group jazz. My mom was a, a singer. She sang in you know church choir kind of stuff, beautiful voice. So we had a lot of choir music. Uh, mm -hmm. That kind of stuff was was around me all the time. And then uh, when I decided to play, it was the summer before my senior year of high school. I didn't start playing until then. And uh, my uh, my dad brought up grandpa's drums from the basement. We put them in the front room, and then I just played with records mm -hmm. uh, that my that were my father's records, and you know stuff like uh, James Brown and. Oh, yeah. Other R and B stuff. I I grew up equal amounts of uh, popular music, I guess you would say, and then jazz, which was popular music from the generation before. You know, so that yeah. was my main thing. I sang in choirs all mm -hmm. through my life, but as far as instrumental music, I didn't start till uh, right before my senior year. Okay. You know that um, playing along with records. Remember, mom, all the noise I made. <laughs> we had a really nice stereo it could go loud and the neighbors were very forgiving yeah yeah i was i was doing the same thing man it was just took me on a journey you know the music and sure. the playing yeah i it's still think uh that that's uh in my opinion the, the the best way to to learn is to to emulate things that you hear and uh you know i think you learn things deeply that way there's a lot of uh like in today's world there's a lot of uh music ed aids you know videos and yeah. method books and things like that which are, are very valuable but i think you really uh learn phrasing and uh you just are involved with the music if you're playing with recordings you start being more aware of uh you know bass players piano players horns whatever you're you're playing with so i i still think it's a great way to learn i do too um you know in these days they've had this for quite a while but now it's probably more prevalent because it's easier to drop out an instrument digitally you just take it out right so music minus drums music minus one type of things right and those are nice you know it's also it seems like you know there's quite a value in having a click track um i played in a band where i had to use a click for about 12 years <laughs> so i didn't uh -huh. always like didn't always like all the music but this is more of a dance r&b type of thing but some of it was great but man it really did a lot for my time oh without a doubt man there's a that that's a huge boost uh, we had a band here in the portland area for a while uh, it was called big bang and there were two other ex Kentonites that were in it. And we did all original music. And this was in the eighties. Like when Steps Ahead was doing all that stuff with sequences, we were doing the same kind of things. And uh, it got to a point where there, there'd be escalating, you know, the horn players didn't hear enough. So the monitor mix thing, the, it just kept going up and up and up. Yes. And it got to a point where I couldn't wear phones uh, to keep track of where the beat was. I was the only one that was getting the click. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got, so I just got to a point where I watched a video monitor that oh, wow. had a bouncing ball. Wow. And I would follow that. And, and if I missed, you know, there was a train wreck. And that, <laughs> it, it was really a phenomenal reinforcement tool to, mm -hmm. uh, as long as you could relax into it, into playing time and then trying to make it feel comfortable at the same time you were trying to be the metronome, like you said. 
Yeah, I, I remember the first gig I did with that band. I was called the sub the same day because the drummer was sick. And I knew most of the guys, but I had not played any of that kind of music. Uh, well, and I hadn't played with a sequencer because like the, the bass parts were all synth bass parts. Right. No bass player in the band. The guy did a really good job, Ron Rolo. He's so good at programming this stuff. But uh, every song was four beats for me, four for me to count, and boom, you're off. Right. And uh, I think we were like two or three songs in, and I went to turn up something. I thought it was the volume, but it turned out to be the tempo. So, oh, man. Whoa. Ouch. So that I got the gig after the drummer stopped, but I was, you know, I was learning the knobs. <laughs> right. I got gotcha. you. You know, 12 years, man. It was a good, great experience. Um, so I'm curious, though. Let's go back. You got into playing drums. You're playing your uh, your grandfather's drums your dad brought up. Uh, sounds like we had almost similar pathways. Not my grandfather, but my dad. And I would play his drums all the time. And um, along with records. So how was big band a part of your dad, uh, your parents? your lifestyle back then absolutely yeah. yeah my dad loved uh all of all the swing bands uh benny goodman uh glenn miller uh cy zentner uh the ones he loved uh you know ellington and basie but the ones he really loved were uh, uh woody herman's bands mm -hmm. and uh buddy rich's bands and the kenton band he really really liked that Maynard's band, or, you know, from the 60s. Yeah. Uh, so that stuff was perpetually playing. Long before I started playing drums, I could almost sing all of uh, Gene Krupa's solo from the 1936 Carnegie Hall concert, uh, just because yeah. of repetition. Yeah. My dad would put that on when we were cleaning the house or something. My mom was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And if she was at work on a weekend, uh, he would just turn it up to 11 and we would listen to over and over and over. So I have a huge big band uh, DNA part of my existence because of that. Uh, he also, he likes smaller group stuff too. Uh, but it, it was mainly, you know, I have to keep reminding myself that that was his popular music of the day. It wasn't like, even in my time, if you like big bands, you were not really digging the music of your contemporaries right. uh, for him it was just stuff that was popular you know exactly um I, I wrote down something here i want to make sure i don't forget okay got it well you know it was interesting because um mom remember we we were playing well dad and mom like they met at ithaca college that's where they went to music school here um at ithaca so and i was born in ithaca now that matters but i was so we would uh, hear a lot of classical, you know, Stravinsky and all these other things, which was really cool. And then uh, it was pretty much the same three bands. Like, uh, well, Dad's hero was Gene Krupa, number one. Same here. Buddy mm -hmm. was a big hero. Louis Belson, another one. You know, Mel Lewis, another one. And, uh, oh, Shelly Mann, you know. Yep. And Shelly played with Stan, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. He was... Uh in many people's opinions, uh, the best one. Uh, <laughs> he was tremendous, uh, uh, a wonderful. In fact, uh, I have uh, Shelly Mann's 1963 Leedy drums. You do? Uh, yeah, and I, they're, they're haunted. When I, <laughs> when I play them, I end up playing a lot of things that I normally don't play. They just, uh, I don't know if it's all in my head, probably, but that's the way it works. No, Shelly was a, really foundational in in Stan's band without a doubt did you ever know him I never met him no I saw him play live one time with his group of uh, mankind when they uh <laughs> yeah they warmed up for the Kenton band when I was in college we went to see the Kenton band it was a couple hours away from where the school was and uh Shelley's band opened for Stan oh wow. and uh that's great his band then was really out. They did very, very cutting edge stuff, you know, and the audience, 
they were there to hear Stan's band, who, you know, in the past had always been the progressive band, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Shelley's band was in a new gear, and some of the people in that audience didn't appreciate it so much. I thought it was great. I didn't get a lot of it, but I thought it was really cool. But I never but met him. Um, I, man, I, I, yeah. I wish I met. I wished I could have met him. Actually, me too. I never saw him. Uh, man, mankind. He had the, the. Didn't he own a restaurant or something called Shelley's Manhole? Shelley's Manhole. Yeah, it was a big, big Los Angeles, huge uh, landmark in jazz. Wow. Yeah, he left us too early. That's for sure. Oh, without a doubt. Yep. He left a lot of huge body of work, though. You know. Uh, he did. Luckily, he was recorded a whole bunch, and he he left a lasting impression on thousands of drummers uh he's i think he's as pivotal as as any any other drummer uh wonderful player wonderful musician i i agree you know and when i was a teenager i didn't appreciate that so as time goes on i start to appreciate a lot more of a lot of life and music and arts and everything but yeah i have some vinyl of him also uh small group stuff um really really good so you've got the what they're leady drums Elite? yeah they're right before he or right after he switched over to camco drums okay. uh, the band that he had uh that uh, a friend of mine that moved up here named gary barone was his trumpet player and gary liked playing drums so shelly just gave gary the leadies and when gary moved up to portland he was going to, you know, going for his master's, I think, over in at the University of Portland and living in a real tiny apartment. So uh, he asked me if I'd babysit the drums and they were really in poor shape. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, sure. And I just put them in my basement. And then later his brother moved up here, Mike Barone, who's a great writer, arranger, did a lot of stuff for the Tonight Show band. Okay. And he, uh, yeah, he took the... Uh, he and I took those drums and restored them and he used them in his home studio for a while. Then he got tired of that. And so gave me the drums back. And then uh, I've been babysitting them for 30 some years. Now, Gary, he, he moved to Germany and he passed away a couple of years ago. So okay. uh, I'm, I'm the caretaker of, okay. the, of the drums. Um, so if you don't mind, what I, I'm going to interject some questions from people who are watching. Um, sure. We'll continue on a timeline. But um, uh, Ed Lynch has a question. It says, hope you're well. Would you share three or four things that you would do with a young drummer to keep him or her on a well-rounded path? I've extended their lessons out in order to put some things in that he can uh, do on a consistent basis. But so three or four things you would do with a young drummer to keep them on path, a well-rounded path. Okay. The main thing to me is uh, really emphasizing the importance of being very broad-based in the styles that you're listening to. And pretty much any suggestion I would have for young and old is to keep listening mm. and uh, learn the language, learn the, the like if you know if you have a book on how to speak French, if you don't hear the language spoken, you can't speak the language, even if you know what the words are. So I, I think it's it's really important to get uh, students to listen deeply to the music and go to different uh, arenas. You know, be it a uh, jazz, big band jazz, small group jazz, fusion jazz traditional jazz, uh, then also rhythm and blues and funk and Afro-Cuban music, Brazilian. I really think it's important to expose them to multiple styles and show how the instrument can be used musically in all of those different arenas. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a large part of it. The other part is to uh, make them transcribe what mm -hmm. they're hearing, literally. Yes. Yeah, totally, yeah. Uh, I think that's a big one. Gives you vocabulary, teaches you phrasing, uh, that kind of a thing. Then also to really uh, emphasize the importance of sound of the drums. 
the equipment itself, how it's tuned, symbol selection, kind of drum heads you use for mm -hmm. you know different situations, highlight mm -hmm. that stuff, and then make them listen to drummers that you either assign or that they really like, be they very contemporary or from days past, and make them comment on what makes this drummer unique to them. Mm -hmm. What qualities do they have, be it sound quality, how they play time, mm -hmm. uh, their soloing ability, their comping ability uh, in a big band, how do they set up the band? How do they reinforce? How do they drive the dynamic? Yeah. Uh, so basically uh, th those things, uh, I mean, and all of it again, I mean, I really wanna emphasize the listening part, make them listen at all times. Oh, another thing, make them listen to themselves. So they have to record themselves when they're practicing, yeah. when they're performing, when they're rehearsing, mm -hmm. any of those things and make them develop the ability to be a critical listener when listening to themselves and to be honest and be able to appreciate what they're doing well mm -hmm. and uh, realize when they need to improve and uh, how to you know, really hone in on what is not happening. Say your time's not good in a certain section or mm -hmm. there's some sloppy technique. Make them identify that. You listen to it with them. Listen to their recordings of themselves mm -hmm. and get their opinion first. Then you go back and give, you know, you point out what you have heard. I also suggest, uh, I'm not like a real extreme tough love guy. I, I like the positives. Mm -hmm. So I, I would really stress the, the positive parts so they enjoy the, the, the process, you know, but you also have to insist that they be honest with themselves as they process what they hear. You know, that in itself, just that answer, those answers is a lesson in and of itself. Because it's all of that is probably I can't think of anything more relevant than that group of uh, important statements and thoughts and advice. Because that is a well-rounded, well, it's a well-rounded answer, right? I, mean, I don't mean to be goofy with it, but no, that that that's what we need to do as musicians, especially not to say take away from anyone, but as a drummer, you're the, you're a foundation, you know, and. Right. Time you have a job. It's play for the song, play for the situation and keep the time. So Right. I, I kind of, you know, when I do master classes and uh, clinics and workshops and stuff like that, I, I lightly joke that drummers uh, control the universe. But I'm not joking so much in that you can have a mediocre band with a really kick ass or a really good drummer. And you can have a, a good sounding band. You can have a great band with a bad drummer and it ain't gonna happen. True. And you can't play dynamics unless the drummer reinforces or causes that dynamic contrast. You can't have clarity of sound if the drummer's back there, you know, building a house and hitting everything over and over <laughs> again, every measure, you know, you, you have to, yeah. you have everything at your control. So therefore it's really great but at the same time, it's a huge responsibility. That I learned very much in my big band experience uh, when I was in college and then later into my career that uh, I, I really started realizing how much of the weight of everything is on the drummer's shoulders. And I, I personally, I love that. I think it's cool. Yeah, it is. You know, And, and just to um, add on to that a little bit, I mean, some of our idols recorded themselves. I remember being at the same restaurant, the old stone mill when Buddy was there, Buddy Rich band, Barry Kiner was on the piano. Do you remember oh, yeah. Barry? Did you know? Oh, the, I remember for sure. He was great. Barry was kind of like a son to Buddy, according to, um, well, Kathy Rich, who I got to meet a few years ago and have lunch with, with her and Beverly Getz. And I were like just sitting down talking about their dads, Stan and Buddy. But Barry was... Buddy kind of took Barry as like a son. And I remember being, because Buddy liked to drive his cars separate from the bus, not all the time, depending upon what part of the country and where they were, but he, you know, four hours from New York. So he's in his Mercedes convertible on a break. And Barry is 
they're listening to the previous night's performance and buddy's talking about oh it sucks and this and that he was talking about himself he was talking about the guys sounding good he said ah oh, damn it yes i gotta get that right and barry said well just you know do this play it like this remember it ends on the four end uh of or, or whatever and right so they went back in they started off right with the last song that he was listening to in the car and the the, the point is buddy was you know a genius a great and he still was listening to himself because he always wanted to do the best he could and get better and better oh i'm i'm, I'm sure of it i he was a, a huge massive influence on my technical training trying to i mean there are other guys that like jake Hanna with woody's sure. band that was yeah. really my first model mm -hmm. uh those early 60s encore series phillips recordings that that woody band to me is maybe maybe the best one in my for my taste but anyway jake's stuff was very challenging but it wasn't like extremely uh technical mm -hmm. it was all sound and and clarity and swing and you know buddy's thing was just since he i mean nobody before or since could do what he did technically it's just yeah. it's just not going to happen but so i would try to learn without any private instruction what he was doing mm -hmm. uh from an lp you know it's not yeah. like today you can slow stuff down to 50 percent and all that or, or go so to youtube <laughs> yeah right exactly yeah. so i got the tone arm going back trying to learn the big swing oh man face, me too know, over yeah. and over and over and when i found i didn't know how to read uh and i had developed really good ears and it was easier to BS as a drummer than it is a second trumpet player. You know, you, you could get by if you had good ears. Mm -hmm. And then I heard that Buddy couldn't read. And so that gave me a pass, which yeah. was not a good thing. But, you know, I, I later, luckily in college, I had a, a wonderful teacher named John Mowat who and just, he refused to let me play in his band. He recruited me to go to Central Washington University and he found out I couldn't read and said, you know, if you don't learn how to read, you're not playing in my band. I had, you know, moved there. And but then he sat down with me every day for for weeks and we just read and read and read. So that part ended up OK. But I remember seeing Buddy, our band, Stan's band and Buddy's band uh, came off of Christmas break at the same time. And we mm -hmm. stayed at the Century Paramount Hotel uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. And Buddy's band was rehearsing in one of the banquet rooms just off the lobby. And uh, Buddy couldn't read. And so what they were running new material. And this happened quite often, I guess. He got a drummer from the union to mm -hmm. show up mm -hmm. and play the charts down, the new stuff. Wow. And then he would go up right afterwards and play. Mm -hmm. And it would be like one time that he heard this guy playing, you know, his stuff. I mean, it's not simple, no. right? And he would, he, I saw it like, I don't know, maybe four tunes. He just crushed it. He nailed it after one listening wow. with all the, no tentative, not like, I hope this is right. You know, it was just like he owned it and just boom, went right through it, you know? So when he sets a, a standard for himself, mm -hmm. the, uh, it's a really high bar if he's going to listen to what he does and be able to criticize it. I respect that very much to hear that, uh, that story. That's great. Yeah. It, it's really impressive to me because, um, well, I had been recording myself a lot just because I, I really just thought I should. My dad had an old reel to reel, you know, and a microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, believe it or not, I still have, mom, I still have some of those real, real tapes <laughs> of me. But um, yeah, when I saw that, it really inspired me a lot too. I heard, I had heard stories that he couldn't read and I've heard similar stories about somebody playing it down for him and he'll hear it like once and then just go kill it, you know? So it's just yeah. so interesting. He evidently, obviously had huge ears. Oh, just um, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see well we have a couple of things. oh jay jay just says thank you oh well such a brilliant answer or description when we were asking about 
uh, what you do for somebody a well-rounded three or four suggestions. So I agree, oh. Jay, that was a great, that was a great lesson in and of itself. Um, Mickey has a question at some point here though, I want to get to your connection with Stan too and how that happened and you know, what the experience was like, but before we do, Mickey Tocola says, how does drumming for jazz, blues and rock differ and which do you prefer? I actually don't prefer any of them at this time of my life. Mm -hmm. At different times, probably it would have been a different answer. But as I mentioned earlier, when I started playing drums, uh, it was my last year of high school and I played in the stage band is what they called the, right. the big bands then, you know, mm -hmm. that when they were in school are called stage bands. And it, uh, it was a really good band, uh, really good musicians. I was, I, I was just lucky that this man da named Dale Beacock uh, allowed me in because I, I didn't know how to do anything. And I was pulled up with the talent of that band. Mm -hmm. So it was intimidating, but I loved it. Uh, the other part of it was though, I got in this band called Little Curtis and the Blues mm -hmm. that was the, the the main hippest r b band in this area you know and uh so we were playing all that all the popular music from the mid 60s and uh so that's an equal part of my foundation i respect it just as much uh and then as r b and blues progressed i was totally open to anything new. I've never been, uh, even after all this time, I've never gotten to a point where I just go, okay, I don't like that. I may not prefer it, but I can find something respectable in virtually anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but during that time, especially in my foundation time, there was so much great music. Uh, you know, back when there was AM radio in a car, for example, yeah, there wasn't like the oldie station and then the R and B, you know, R and B station and the country station. You'd hear Tex Ritter, then you'd hear Ray Conniff, then you'd hear B uh, Buddy Rich, mm -hmm. and then you'd hear Miles Davis, and then you'd hear Paul Ritter and the Raiders. I mean, it was that's just the way it was, and that's the way my base is of, of my mm -hmm. of my being musically. So uh, I love playing them all. Lately, I've been uh, until all the COVID stuff yet. I started playing, and Nicky, he's a Vancouver boy. He, he's gone to see some concerts with his uh, a blues band I play with, a guy named Terry Robb, a tremendous kind of a Delta finger style blues player mm -hmm. who I'd known for decades but never had played with. And then I did his album, and then we started doing some uh, gigs behind it. And it's just like a trio, sometimes a quartet with another kind of a rhythm guitar. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's just, I loved it because after I loved the, the opportunity to play jazz all these years, I honestly, I'm un, unbelievably fortunate, mm -hmm. but I realized how much I missed playing blues and rhythm and blues. Uh, it's I, I, the sounds of it, the feel of it, the tuning of the drums. I yeah. just really, I missed it. I just really missed it. So the answer is I don't have a, a favorite and I try to, when I practice and when I play with recordings, I try to keep a real broad base, even now of a mixture of styles. Oh, that's good advice too. Well, you know, the one thing that I, I was fortunate to be pretty well-rounded, so I ended up working a lot. And that, well, you that's know, what if, you have to do if, to work, right? I, it, yeah, I mean, to, especially if you want to make a living at it, and which I did uh, off and on for years is, you had to place you just had to it's the only way you know especially if you're in you know the better paying gigs were the weddings and corporate things so right. you're not going to be playing maybe your preferred kind of music but if you want to earn some decent money um maybe you got to pay some bills it's good to know that stuff that they play in whatever band it is sure you know, I never really enjoyed playing blues until i played with a blues guitar player who changed everything. And I think it just had to do with the feel of his guitar playing and his voice. 
Mm -hmm. The real deal. And we even recorded a CD, and I like that CD. It's a good one. Um, real simple, though, too. is nothing fancy. Nothing no. fancy. It's, this is just total pocket. It's just, you know, whether it's shuffly or a backbeat, it felt good. Yeah. It felt good. So let's move forward a little. I'm curious because, uh, uh, I, I, you know, the other day, I'm going off for just a second. I found on, uh, I think it was YouTube, and I have it on vinyl downstairs, but I don't want to go downstairs and get it. So uh, is City of Glass, Stan Kenton, uh -huh. City, City of Glass. That's, that's pretty out. But I, <laughs> I did that. I played that, and uh, I mean, I had listened to it a few times mm -hmm. coming up because it was especially with Kenton fans it's a it's kind of a iconic piece and some yeah. some some people hate it mm -hmm. uh because it is so it's just such a departure from <laughs> from everything was, and down in uh, mm -hmm. we had a there's a thing about los angeles jazz institute uh would have these uh, two times a year, they'd have these kind of week-long festivals out by the LAX in a, in a convention center there. And uh, it was all, mo a lot of big band stuff. And they would have a dedicated week of just Kenton stuff mm -hmm. or a week of, you know, only big band music. And I got called to go down there quite a few times. And uh, you play maybe six sets through the week with different bands most of the guys were la guys and then they mm -hmm. fly some of us in and uh you know the level of and depth of talent down there is ridiculous yeah. so you'd have one rehearsal playing stuff and then you do us then you play a concert that day mm -hmm. and uh and, you know i get you on your toes well it came to the city of glass thing there's a guy from amsterdam i can't remember his name but he's dedicated his whole life uh, to that that music and uh he conducted and i was extremely nervous because my reading chops for like uh contemporary uh classical music mm -hmm. they're just not very good and that stuff is so disjointed it, you can't even tell where anything is but i listened to it a bunch and absorbed what i could but i really got to a point i went i saw the drum parts i'm going now I'm just going to have to BS my way through. And I'm sitting right next to the guy when we're rehearsing. Oh, and wow. I, I know he's going to bust me yeah. for missing some, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just kind of skated through and played when I thought it was right and everything. He didn't even look at me one time. And I was so relieved. But that was one of the deepest musical experiences I've ever had, sitting in the midst of that, being mm -hmm. played by all these great musicians. Can't even imagine that. Oh, it was it was unworldly i've never played any music like that before uh and that the performance was was wonderful it was just goosebump time you know really cool it's so great i mean as my dad would say you know stan especially with that and some of the other stuff he did was way ahead of his time i mean he was just so far well disjointed is a real good word actually and i love that it's appropriate and i love that city of glass is great to me um, and I remember too, that, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We're going to go back. I think my, my first time seeing Stan was in 71. I was almost 10. No, I was 10. And, uh, the Baron was on drums. My hero, the guy that convinced me to play professionally. Really? That's fantastic. Yep. I, you know, I only met him the one time. I only saw him the one time. He had a big symbol with a crack in it. And, Still uh, have he passed away but he yeah 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 sadly he did um he was in the midwest i think indiana or something like but, cincinnati uh, indianapolis when mm -hmm. i met him he was living in indianapolis he was going to he was stan's drummer when i went to uh i won a, a collegiate award from a contest out here mm -hmm. uh, national jazz education NAJE used yep. to have these six regional competitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we won the Northwest uh, when I was a student at Mount Hood Community College. Oh. And it, uh, I won Outstanding Musician of the festival. So I got this uh, scholarship to go to a Kenton clinic in Springfield, Missouri. And that's where I met John. 
And uh, that week changed my whole life. It, it totally, I didn't even know what I was going to do with music. Uh, e even as being a professional, I was majoring in music education and health PE and recreation. And I was just there to play music. I was a horrible student, but I, I had no idea what I was going to do. And then he said, you got to, you got to play. See, that's so he so almost cool. ordered so, me and that gave me a pass. Well, this is the perfect segue because I wanted to find out about how you got connected with Stan. And I'm, I was curious to know also if you went to one of the camps. So you did. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, it, it, it really was, it was just, it just recalibrated everything in my, my whole life, really, not just mm -hmm. music. It just, all my priorities shifted. Uh, I heard a sound, his sound, John's sound. Uh, I, I retuned everything. I, 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 you know, I've got big symbols all over this house because of him. I, I love that sound. Yeah. Uh, but just to hear that band play live and to be able to be involved all week with just the energy of it and, and see concerts every night and uh, to be in bands that were killing, just crushing. There were like 13 big bands worth of students oh, wow. at the, in those days. This is like 71. Yes. And uh, it just, uh, it was phenomenal. The thing was, Stan was ill. He had some surgery done, so he wasn't at that camp. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had been real lucky and played in the in the top band and uh some of the guys in the band especially john and ramon lopez remember him the i comedy. remember him man he was a, such a nice guy too oh tremendous and yeah. uh some of the other guys remembered my performance enough to uh recommend it to stan wow, that's uh, nice. you know that sometime i might play so uh I, you know at that time i I only started playing in 65, so I'd only been playing five years or so. I was getting better quick, but not that quick. And uh, I made it through that Mount Hood Community College experience, still not being able to read hardly anything. So I was still kind of flying by ear. And then when I uh, went up to Central Washington University, which is in Ellensburg, Washington, in the center of the state, two hours east of Seattle, okay. uh, I started, uh, I got hooked up with a program there where, as I mentioned, this John Mao had forced me to read and really helped complete a lot of my musicianship. Well, what had happened though, I was also in the Army Reserve Band. I did that, uh, there were no, uh, there's no heroism. I did it so I wouldn't get shot, you know, and, and uh, I but I, it's a six year obligation. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was at summer camp, at Fort Ord, we had to do this every year. You had to go to a summer camp thing. I got a call from Dick Shear. This is a uh, oh yeah, seventy two, I guess. He's a Kenton and, guy. Uh, and Jerry McKenzie, oh yeah, had come on after John. He had been on before with yes. Detroit Jerry McKenzie, the one that's the, the cop. Yep. And so uh, when I had gone to see Shelley's band that I mentioned. Uh, he is the drummer that had been with Stan then. So okay. anyway, he was going to split. And um, uh, Dick Shearer called up and got a hold of my father. My father called me down in Monterey, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called Dick back and he offered me the job. It was but Dick the trombone player? Yeah, he was the lead bone player. Because I remember band. him. I remember meeting him too a couple of mm -hmm. times. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he was a, a real... So kind of like a second command guy mm -hmm. and uh there, there's a two-week summer camp and we had just started uh, that camp and so he asked me if i wanted to go and god i mean it was the ultimate opportunity yeah so i went and la asked the real army guy if i could get excused and of course not you know i mean <laughs> <laughs> this is real army for a minute so yeah. i had to call him back and and say no and he said, okay, he says, uh, we're going to, we'll bring in this, this young guy for a couple, you know, see if it works out. And if it doesn't work after a couple of weeks and you're done, maybe we can work something out. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that young guy was Pete Erskine. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, 
well, we all know what a God he is and what he did starting at such a, especially such a young age, just unbelievable, great talent. So, yeah. uh, you know, three years later, I got another call and that's when I uh, went out. And I'm really, I'm so glad because during that three years, I upped my game a whole bunch higher than I would have been if I would have gone earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially again, that, that central Washington experience uh, the, the music we played, and I, I know this is a fact, that the, the John Mao, the director, he liked the music, but he also was kind of helping me out because I had a path that I was on, and he realized it, and he wanted to reinforce it. So as we're playing this music, he really gave me a whole bunch of input on what was good and what not good that I was playing and helped formulate my path that way. And uh, the band was tremendous. Uh, there's some of the names that are on uh, your list that are watching. Some of these guys are in that program. And they were, they were especially for those days, it was phenomenal. So I was more hooked up and ready to go when I came on in, in uh, 75. See, that's great. You know, uh, great to have somebody like him to help you on that path, right? And that's he was a, a wonderful, you, wonderful, yeah. wonderful teacher. Wonderful can't, teacher. Can't measure the value in that. Well, it's interesting because, yeah, um, I'll just interject for a minute. So, Mom, if you're still watching, this is actually bringing back goosebumps for me because it was such a, as a 10-year-old watching The Baron, I'd seen Buddy already a couple, like about a year before, and maybe that same year because, you know, when I saw Buddy Rich the first time when I was nine, that was it. It sealed the deal. I'd been messing around on drums. Now I had to get serious. So then the baron and so we're in this little place i don't know if you ever played there's a little place it's funny because peter remembers it I'll, I'll get to that in a minute it's a, called the castaways restaurant and it's still here it's still in business they jammed all of all the band into this little area in a restaurant uh elevated kind of like a stage although it wasn't meant to be a stage uh it, mom and dad and myself were sitting at the table right next to Stan. He was just over this little bear, this little wall. Stan is there and the bear, and I could see the Baron and the big crack. What was that crack symbol? That's a- It was a 25 inch pre-war Zildjian. Gosh, you never hear That's, of a 25 a, inch anymore. <laughs> no, it, it looked, by the time he quit playing it, it kind of looked like a map of France. I mean, there were so many hooks yeah. cut out of it and he was putting rivets in the middle of it and on the edge and- Yeah, I forgot about that. And... <laughs> but you know, that that band stan was just so amazing and in, in, in the music and the arranging and the composing and the the power i'll just never forget being that being that close literally we could probably reach over and like touch his elbow that's how close we were and that in itself is very powerful because there's something about you know when i'm in a clinic or a, a presentation or i want to learn something or a class i'm front row it's the only way i'm going to learn really well and be experiencing things. I'm a front row guy. I'll go. I saw Dennis Chambers with Frank Gambale about a year and a half ago. And uh, my friend Mike Pope was playing bass. And I was front row dead center in a small theater. I'm like, yes, this is great. So anyways, I got to absorb all that. But anyways, uh, the Baron was really cool. Such a gentleman. Uh, uh, Ramon Lopez was so cool. Such a gentleman and very encouraging very encouraged yeah. to play and experiment and find what you like. And then I remember my dad asking Stan, who's your favorite band? Tito Puente. He said, you got to get some Tito Puente. So from then on, mom, remember, and you still got all the vinyl Tito. And then it led to other things too, you know, but uh, the next year I saw, we were sitting at the same table, the same exact thing. And Peter was there with that head with the drums with no heads on the bottom or the front of the bass right. and a bunch yeah. of different symbols <laughs> it was actually i was talking about it with him last week he was saying something about yeah mel, mel lewis told stan I'd tell that kid to put some heads on the bottoms <laughs> no i remember that kid yeah there's something like uh, somebody i guess stan might have responded hey, he's just a kid give him a break <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, highly impactful. And then 
saw him another time with Stan, but then uh, he went with Maynard, and that's then when you came on with Stan, I was like fourteen, so I I rode my bike over there, so that's where I got uh-huh. to see you. And you know, that's a really powerful thing to be a young kid, passionate about this stuff, and there you are. There's the band, the, you know, a I little agree. a little restaurant like the old stone mill with all those right. horns. That's a lot. That's a big presence, you know. So, so you went on with uh, with Stan then in uh, seventy five for a couple of years, right? I was there th- through seventy seven. Yeah. So I don't usually ask this question, but I will ask this. Oh, Jimmy Phillips, Jimmy. Hey, man, it's good to see you. I remember seeing the Kenton Orchestra in that period. Our high school jazz group attended a clinic with the band at a nearby high school in Canton, Ohio. So Stan did a lot of educating, didn't he? Well, he's, I think pretty, it's pretty much accepted that he's kind of the father of jazz education Mm -hmm. in schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was a huge part. Uh, Like we toured 48 weeks of the year and we usually work seven nights a week, very little time off. And we get two weeks off over Christmas and two weeks in the summer. And a large percentage of the stuff we did was concert clinics at high schools and colleges and universities around the country. So there was a huge a part of our, our, I mean, it partially would just keep you on the road, right? Yeah. In those days, the music wasn't as popular where you would get people to show up at Idora Park or, you know, the big ballrooms or jazz clubs and stuff so you had to augment it to stay busy but yeah. also it's what stan wanted to do he wanted to educate the young and keep the uh, keep the music alive that way and so uh yeah we did lots of that. that's where we all got our chops on how to be how to do clinics and concerts and and, that's great. and things like that you get to do that every day that you know it's like playing every day it makes you more prepared to deal with uh, the educational parts well you know I, I taught drum lessons for a couple of years and i was horrible and which is probably why i hated it i would if i did it now i'd actually be probably decent at least um but it's because i teach other stuff now and i'm learning you know learned and still learning it's always a learning process how to present to articulate explain so people hopefully understand but then the other thing too is if i was to teach drums now i think i'd more learn more about drumming personally than the student would because that's how it is when i teach anything else i do in the neuro rehab business and i mean so teaching is really keeps you being a student constantly you know uh yeah and the older I've gotten the more I, I see that that's the case. I totally agree with you. I don't think I realized it till about five years ago, six years ago, but <clears throat> it's really important. Uh, yeah, uh, Jimmy was saying, well, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, it's this is a fun conversation, man. Uh, at the time, we had a saxophone player named Mark Vinci who went to, went to North Texas State and later with Woody Herman Band. Great conversation, and thanks, guys. I don't know, Mark. I did see, I got to see Woody with, uh, first time was with Joe LaBarbera. Yeah. That was smoking. Oh, I'm sure. Anything he does is smoking. <laughs> yeah, that guy's something. Um, I, I had a thought here. So, man, you're doing 48 weeks a year. That's, that's some heavy road time, but what a great, it's, that must have been like being in an institution with Stan, you know? Oh, well, it was. Yeah. We were lucky. Like, you know, the, the guy that, uh, the, the Woody Herman veteran there, or the guys that played on uh, Maynard's band, Buddy's band, uh, we, were the, we were the tail end of that uh, perpetual road rat stuff, you know? Yeah. I didn't have a, I didn't, I had a home address, but I didn't have a home. I didn't have a car. Mm-hmm. I had nothing. I just... I just was uh, on that bus all the time. And there's nothing like that training. You have, mm-hmm. you know, if you're sick, if you're healthy, if you're happy, if you're bugged at the guys you're playing with, whatever it is, you got to get out every single night and perform the music at the highest level. 
And uh, there's, there is no other experience like that. There's nothing that really approximates it even. Uh, yeah. It was a unique time to be able to experience that. Earlier on, you know, that was kind of, there was, that was more normal, but uh, we just got the, got the end of that time. Yeah, it was an era and it was a beautiful era. I'm actually, I remember Stan's bus because I got to go on it. The bus driver, I don't know his name, really nice guy. Uh, so this would be in 75 or six, I'd say. Uh, well, you know, probably Dave, some, Dave, Dave Scott might have been it. Maybe, you know, I think if I piece it together, I think they ran that series of, you know, Buddy, Stan, Maynard in 76. Because when I saw Peter there, he was with Maynard and he had the Maynard Olympic shirt on because they did something at the Olympics that year. I think it was in Montreal. Oh, so yeah, seven, yeah. So 76. I remember and that. Um, the bus driver, you know, I parked my bicycle and I'm talking with him. He's really nice. And uh, he's like, oh, come on and sit down. Well, Stan was right there. It's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool. Stan was always really friendly, though. Really friendly with me. We met him. I don't know, three times maybe. Mm -hmm. He was a great, a great guy. Great impression from Stan. Uh, actually, more than that, actually, because he came and sat at our table at that restaurant both years in a row on a break, sat with us. The whole mm -hmm. time. Um, did you have any favorite pieces you liked um, performing with Stan? Any particular um, songs? I don't. I, I don't think I could. I mean. It would change because we, we would do a lot of the same program for a, quite a few weeks in a row. Uh, and then, I mean, that's one thing about being on the road like that. You don't get time to rehearse very much. So you most, I didn't even look at my book. Most of the guys had your book memorized by then. So uh, anything, even if it's great, you know, if you do it over and over and over again, sometimes it loses its luster a little bit. So there were times where one tune might have been my favorite, and then after three months, I never wanted to hear it again. You know, so it, it's hard to identify that. But there was a there were kind of like two different books. There was a dance book that we'd play for old folks, and uh, you know, do four hour dance gigs. Wow! And uh, we'd play all the old hits. You know. And a lot of the Lenny Niehaus stuff. Oh yeah, was tremendous. I mean, it was all. It was much. It was really a swinging book. A mm -hmm. lot of swing music. In the stuff we played in the colleges and stuff, it was uh, more of the new stuff that was was on the recordings because they're trying to sell records, right? Mm -hmm. And the creative world was his record label, and we'd always have a little mobile record shop out in the lobby. So uh, that stuff was more. I don't know, it wasn't called that then, but it was more like fusion music, like jazz rock kind of stuff and uh, some Latinish stuff. Uh, we didn't do, a, Stan was always very forward moving. He didn't like doing the dances because mm -hmm. it was too nostalgic. He, he wanted new stuff. He didn't want to dwell on the past. So uh, every now and then he'd dig out something from like, you know, bands decades earlier uh, that, that would really be fun to play. But then we always do the theme, artistry and rhythm. Yeah. Peanut, peanut vendor. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, that kind of stuff. And, you know, some of that would get a little repetitious to me. Mm -hmm. We did intermission riff all the time, but I like that because every night we did that, I got an open drum solo. Oh, so that's there, there was that, cool. you know. <laughs> yeah, that's but, great. Uh, there, there was a, you know, there's a, a, a little minor, just a little minor booze mm -hmm. written by Willie Maiden. That yeah, was great. Oh, I always right. tried to recreate what Von Olin did on that one. It's mm -hmm. like a minor blues, a real, real cool. I, you know, we did one that I, I still think is one of the greatest big band charts ever written called, uh, it was just called Savoy. It was a Bill Holman arrangement oh. based on stomping at the Savoy. But if you hear the arrangement, the melody isn't even stated at it for a couple minutes. He's, it's very disguised with his counterpoint. But that chart, I think any guy I talk to that's played that chart loves that chart. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's close to perfection, you know. 
So maybe that was my favorite. Interesting. You know, it just makes me think of a couple of things. And then Gary, or I'm sorry, Ed, Ed has a question. So we're, Ed, we're going to get to that in just a second. You mentioned quite a while back here about transcribing things. And you know, um, the only thing I've ever transcribed was drum stuff because I wasn't, didn't know how to do the rest. I didn't, wasn't knowledgeable enough. Don't remember enough about music theory. To, but anyways, uh, I'll tell you that charts, I understand, I started to understand reading charts better. Of course, not every chart's notated anywhere near these, the same, but uh, if you get to know somebody and how they notate and this and that, but just transcribing helped me tremendously. And I did a lot of transcribing when I was in my 20s. Uh, I, cause I'm very good at learning things. If I listen, like I'd rather hear an audio book cause I'm a horrible reader of words and I'll remember if I hear audio, but I also like to see things like video and pictures. So to me, having a transcription out that I can look and listen at the same time, of course, back then I've got the, uh, 33 R I, I did a transcription of, uh, it's one of the three quartet songs on a Chicory album that Gad played on. Oh. Right. And then That's actually, so I, trust me, I am not trying to impress anybody, but they modern drummer published it. And now I just found out some skip Haddon. Do you know skip at Berkeley? I know the name, but I've never met him. We, we have a Wednesday 11 to noon every morning, Eastern time. Uh, just drum talk. We do. And he's, 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 really something but i didn't know they're using that transcription i did at berkeley so yay for me no i'm not trying to impress anybody but when i put that together i could visually see relationships in things form sure it. and how of course yeah and how he's just has this beautiful way of playing over a form and building and releasing and building and releasing and uh it made it so I could read charts better. Now, maybe that's just me, but it was really helpful. No, I, I think it's totally, I, I think that, you know, you can buy transcriptions, right? Yeah, yeah. But I don't think that's the way to do it. I, I think, do it I yourself, think right? when, you, when you go through the exercise of doing it, the results is exactly what you mentioned just now. So I think it's a deeper learning because yeah. uh, you have to listen to it to do mm -hmm. it right. And you go over and over and over and over. So you get to where you can sing bass parts and you can, you can sing second trumpet parts of big band stuff. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that chick, uh, uh, thing, I'm, I'm a, a huge fan of his. I'm so sad he passed. Me too. But I had it on yesterday morning because, uh, in fact, mom's the one who, who sent me a message, like not even 15 minutes after it was announced on chick's Facebook page that he passed. And uh, right, oddly enough, when well, he passed, I, I was talking. Go. I play with that quartet's thing all the time, I, and I play with a lot of of his music, uh, especially since COVID hit. Yeah, just to try to keep in shape, I'll sit down here and uh, I'll play with a lot of those things. Uh, yeah. With Brian Blade, with Wackel, oh, I'm in touch with Dave quite a, quite often, and I met him when he was at at that same Drury. Uh, at a camp in Missouri that I went oh, to wow. as a student. Oh yeah, he's, a, he's the St. Louis boy. Yeah, right. I met him at that clinic. He was uh, in ninth grade, and I auditioned oh, him. And I was like, "What the hell's wrong with this guy?" I mean, he was—I've never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just unbelievably, just especially for that age, and always really nice. You know, little kid, you know, like a little soccer boy. You know, yeah. and he killed it. He just was great. And then later that summer, we did a camp out in out by LA, Costa Mesa College, and Chad Wackerman was there. Oh. And Chad was the same age and a little boy, and he killed it also. I'm just, my mind was spinning like, you know, what's in the water nowadays? These guys playing this good when they're little kids, you know. It, uh, but, but yeah, anyway, what is it? Yeah. Playing with, with, yeah. playing with, uh, with those recordings of Chick, you, and he Chick was a great drummer, and you yeah, can he hear was. that in his playing. When when and the conversation and the communication between he and the drummers, mm -hmm. Brian Blade, all these guys, especially those live performances. Yeah, the le it's the highest level of improvisational music to me. It's just 
the, the smallest part of a second mm -hmm. and everybody's reacting the same way. It's, it's magical, you know, and you don't get that experience and exposure to that by buying a transcription. You no. get it by doing like you did with Gad's uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. and, and then you start seeing it. Like you're saying, it's like looking at a score of music, you know, you see yeah. where the clarinets are, where the flutes are, where the trumpets are, you know, it's, it's the best way. It's really interesting. Um, I, I really, I did a lot of transcribing, a lot of Roy Haynes stuff and uh, a little bit of, El well, Elvin is hard to transcribe, you know, because you can't strive, well, you, you can't, can't write you down. Bracket those, no, it needs, yeah, you can't write down feeling. Code. Feeling is uh -huh. not transcribable. Right, it's a lot of it's just. Then there's that stroke. whole thing with Elvin, like, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah. How did he do it? Sure. I mean, how did he even, but that was Elvin. You know, so speaking of yep. Dave, this would be a good time to just maybe interject a little thing. So I got to know him a few years ago through Jimmy Haslip, who has been a friend for a long time. Um, just a, a really a beautiful friend and uh, a real sweet guy. So he hooks me up with Dave in New York City and a few years ago, and we ended up actually doing an interview about living a healthy lifestyle on the road. So that was really fun. And Dave was there with his wife, who's from Italy. They were in, we just hung out in the ho his hotel suite for hours, did the interview. And we didn't talk about drums hardly uh, during the interview. And then after that, we talked about cars. Corvettes with him. Oh, yeah. He's got that. He's got a hot rod Corvette boy for sure. So two years ago this month, and probably this week, I was in LA recording a CD. And when I say this, trust me, it's a good thing I only played on two songs. So it was terrible. I hadn't played a live gig in five years or played drums because I needed to take time off. But those are more for a fundraiser project for the foundation I started for Parkinson's. So uh, uh, do you know Jeff Richmond, guitar player? I don't think so, huh? Well, I've been following Jeff for years. Jimmy called me. He's like, I got a friend with Parkinson's. Can you help him out? Because he was wanted to get the, the tremor hand or the pick hand to stop tremoring when he was playing because it was really interfering. So there's some vibration therapy we can do for that. And that's actually been uh, very helpful for him and others. But bottom line is uh, I had to teach in LA. And so long story short, I went out and I was going to teach, you know, Jeff, come on to the workshop, be my guest. It's a Parkinson's workshop for two days. So I got out there early. We hung out. First place I went wasn't even the hotel. It was Jeff's place. And then we went out to lunch and this and that. Well, later that same day, I got an email from Dave saying, you're in town, just come to my house to so do another interview on like mindset for success. So we, uh, I go to his house and he starts showing me like pictures and stuff of the vet that he said he can't even drive it on the street because it's too big of a, too much house power. <laughs> right. So we talk about cars for hours. It was, and he had just gotten a, a, not a new, but a limited edition Mercedes wagon with like only a hundred were made with this particular engine in it, autographed by the engine designer. Right. That sucker's like G-force rating zero to whatever. And like, pfft. No, exactly. No, he, he uh, I remember when he was looking for that because he didn't want to get a, an S, like a little SUV or anything. He wanted a wagon. Yeah. And he wanted it to have those qualities. Yeah. He, I remember when he was looking for that. Well, he opened well, up the hoodie. You, know, you can go, if you've gone to his, uh, there's a, a website you can go to and watch his, you know, all of his time trials and stuff out at the raceway. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually pretty cool. Um, just get on YouTube. You can just Google Dave Weckl Corvette right. or something. And yeah, he's got the cam, the dash cams and all that. Yeah, he's flying. It's pretty cool. Oh, have you ever been yeah, in the car? Is. Have you been ever been on the track with him? No, no, I haven't. No, I've just just witnessed it over the over the tube, you know. Yeah, no, I didn't either. I'm just curious. Yeah, I remember looking at the engine in that Mercedes. Like, whoa! But wait a minute. So let's let's talk. You you like cars? Right? Yeah, I'm not. Older cars? What do you have a car or two? We've got a couple of. We've got a couple of old cars. We've got a, a 57 Ford 
F100 pickup that's got a, I don't want to get too card, but I mean, it's got like a 302 V8 in it and a, a, a C4 automatic transmission and it's That's hot sweet. rotted up got some old school mags on it and stuff sits yeah, you real send low. me a picture of that and the, whatever the other one yeah. it's that's my wife's car basically and then i've got a 51 ford that was topless when i bought it in fact when i bought it it was basically just the body and then the guy that built it for me uh his name's jim michelson and he's a was a tech inspector for nascar and so uh we built it on a 83 Buick chassis and then got a 350 Chevy crate engine in it and uh, a turbo automatic. And uh, then I just had a, they cut the top off of it in 58. So it was just a convertible with no top. And then I, um, yeah, that's what that's it looked it. like when I got it. Yep. Now it's, uh, now it's finished up and it's, uh, yeah, that's you, the pickup. You sent me that's these. Right. I saved these because, you know. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that, the pickup. That is sweet, man. That's a beautiful looking ride. It's, it's a nice little rig. It's got a 302? And, then, uh, and that's got a 302. And then the, mm -hmm. the 51 has a 350. Oh, then I had nice. a, a, a removable hard top made for that car. Oh, cool. So it's, uh, yeah, I, where I live has always been, uh, Vancouver, Washington's always been kind of color car culture -y. back in the 60s yeah i think hot rod magazine said per capita this was the best cruise down in america you know <laughs> so do you do you and your your wife ever race <laughs> no go down the no, highway and slow, race each other i'm <laughs> just slow kidding low. no no I, we, I just, they both sound they both sound really good I and they, they, they would go i've taken the the 51 out a couple times just to see how fast it would go and make sure the brakes work. But uh, I've never been like a speed demon. I just look like I'm good, you know. I mean, yeah. You know, I, uh, same here, except I will admit, and not not on the Mustang we have, I wouldn't do it, but uh, on a rental car. I, I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale a couple of years ago, rented, it was brand new V8 Camaro, three miles. Three, I was the first person to rent this car. And it actually had a G-force uh, gauge on the dash. Oh, really? And, and I so I didn't want to go fast and like get a ticket, but I would go zero to any speed limit as fast as possible. And that thing, of course, it's a terrible way to break in a new car, right? Right. Have Carl drive it. But what a blast, man. Is it? Yeah. It sounded so good. Well, man. you know, a lot of those, you, you mentioned Buddy wanting to drive his own car woody used to do it too he had a corvette oh, and he wouldn't ride the bus sometimes he'd take off driving mm -hmm. uh and meet the band there uh i don't know if stan did that it would have been earlier on but i know woody was very much into just taking his own cars when he could so uh yeah buddy was driving a mercedes one time and then uh i, I think the other time it was a bentley or something like that he had a few cars according to so who just told me that the other day i don't know somebody who knew him was telling me, uh, skip skip Haddon, i think um well yeah i just wanted to interject sorry folks we had to talk about cars because we're uh <laughs> car people so you know if do you have a little bit more time i'm you know i got nothing to do here it's too cold outside okay well um ed lynch has a question that's been here for a while. I'm sorry, Ed. I got excited talking about everything. Uh, says, Gary, would you talk about Kenton's ability to get young players out of the colleges like he did in, in cent with Central? Uh, he did a good job, job of keeping his band young. I, we always noticed that too. In fact, a lot of the bands, like Buddy's band was pretty young. Woody's, I think. I never, I didn't really see Woody as much as the other two, but yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I think what happened, well, the, the young part is partially the 48 weeks of the year, right? Yeah. If I went out and, that, and did that now, I'd be dead. I mean, we, <laughs> it's a very, it's a young man's thing, unless yeah. you're somebody like Stan, who had a, 
different DNA. All those band leaders that stayed on the road were unique individuals. But all of the big bands, uh, Stan's band, he drew, as far as like, you know, drawing a lot from central from our region at that central Washington mm -hmm. that's because there were guys on the band from the region and then when somebody would quit you would get suggestions from people on the band so okay. that's kind of how that comes about there are other times where there were no people from the northwest actually with the Dave Bardoon was a writer arranger did send in the clowns funny valentine those things okay he had a, a foot in uh, there was a couple guys from uh, trombone players, Lloyd's and Dave Kine, that were from the state of Washington, but they went to uh, Western Washington University. Uh, but then Alan Yankee, who was a writer arranger, uh, got called to do uh, the baritone sax chair. Mm -hmm. And then they recommended me. And then uh, there were other guys from uh, Greg Metcalf, Terry Lane, were guys I went to college with. They played in the sax section. Jeff Usitalo, a trombonist from the Portland area. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why at that time there were so many Northwesterners on it. It was kind of, but and then the other thing is that Stan, I mean, uh, Woody's band, he would draw a lot of guys out of North Texas, for example, mm -hmm. when I was on Lyle Mays and Steve Houghton were playing with the band. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they had gone to North Texas. Buddy got a lot of guys from Berkeley, mm -hmm. Cal or, uh, Boston. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's kind of just depends where the we spend, spends time and and where the the leader wants to find the talent. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I think it's almost coincidental as far as what school is represented. With the I must, I must say. Berkeley and uh, North Texas have had such a huge output of high-end musicians coming out of there. They, you know, you could, it would be a safe bet to hire a guy that played in the one o'clock band at North Texas, let's say. So yeah. I think that, that they were, that was, there was like more. The, and I'm sorry to interrupt. So I just learned this yesterday, talking with Mike Pope, he, he went there. So it was like, they had nine nine different bands when he was there. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four. They right. named them for the hour. So it's my impression the one o'clock band was like the highest. Oh, they were. Musicians like the best yeah, band. Yeah. yeah. Without okay. And they had been around that program started in the 40s, late 40s. Okay. Yeah. Leon Breeden did it. And uh, there were, when I first heard North Texas is when I was going to that Mounted Community College. Mm -hmm. And we heard them uh, back east at this, you know, the, the final thing where everybody from the six, the six uh, re regions comes together and performs. It's not mm -hmm. a contest there, luckily, because it wouldn't have been anywhere near fair because North Texas had all the road rats. Cassidy had been out on the road, got tired of it, and they were in their 20s and mm -hmm. wanted to go back and get a degree. Mm -hmm. And they were seasoned professionals. Yeah, Ed right. Soap. Uh, oh yeah yeah and you know I'm i hear a he's a cool playing. guy and a fun guy to be around oh unbelievably cool <laughs> i went down and did a thing there a few years ago right before he retired he asked me to come down and i did two seminars there uh talking about whatever kind of like what we're doing except live and uh it's just he's one of the most refreshingly funny totally respectful mm -hmm. but uh you know kind of potty humor <laughs> i don't know how to describe it he's that's just what i've heard guy. yeah, yeah he, he's, cool. he's hilarious he's brilliant mm -hmm. probably one of the best drum teachers in the history of the planet mm -hmm. and a phenomenal player you know yeah. uh so that program turned out countless you know tremendous players so i you know to the answer the, of the question uh, I think during the period when uh, Ed went to the same school I did, they mm -hmm. were picking out of there because there were people that were on the band that recommended people they knew. Yeah, makes sense. So a lot of stuff happens, but it's, it's really cool. You know, see, what I like is 
well, a lot of things, but I love hearing the, some of the history and the stories behind this too, because. Oh, for sure. I always wondered about, and it just occurred to me. I remember mom, if you're watching, remember we used to get the creative, creative world newsletter. And when that sucker arrived in the mailbox, that was the best mail ever because it would have a write up about the, maybe some new members. I still have some of those. I, I have several of those the new members. I think I have one where they might have introduced you or announced you. I think I have that. And they'd have tour dates listed too. Could be. And uh, of course right. now it's great with the internet. You just go on and keep refreshing in case a new date is added. Well, pre COVID eventually. You know, right. Other stuff too. But yeah, that was really exciting to get those newsletters. Uh -huh. They were really cool. I think that's the only band I knew of, Stan's band, that did that. I agree. Yeah, he might see, have that's been part of, mm -hmm. That was part of his connection with jazz education, though. That was driven by that. Mm -hmm. So Creative World was his entity and a record yep. label, right? Like it was the corporate. Right. He got he he wanted to. He was with Capital, I think it was, and then he wanted to move on and have more control over his product and the direction of music he wanted to go in. He had a real clear view of what he wanted to do, and he didn't want to have people getting in his way with that. So you mm -hmm. start up your own company, you know, and, and he did. And it worked good for him. Yeah, man. it did. It was real cool. Yeah, you hear these. I mean, you've heard more of this. You've been around it on a professional level way more than I have. But the stories about people who get signed to a label, let's say back in the day, I don't know how it is now, but then they want to change how you do everything. And they kind of dictate. Yeah, you, you know, lose artistic control. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he didn't want that. Uh, he, I mean, I, I wouldn't say he was close-minded, but he had a real uh, clear view of what he wanted to do. And uh, a lot of it had nothing to do. He really didn't like nostalgia. Mm -hmm. He was very outspoken about that. He wanted... Uh, he wanted to move forward and not stay in the past. That was very important to him. Yeah. It seems like, you know, some of the most forward people are like that. I mean, Miles was like that. Absolutely. He would never look, a buddy would said he, he said, I don't want to look at the past. We're going to move right. forward. He might do tunes from the past, but there would a lot of times be a new twist. Even yeah, just a and a lot thing, of times... Little thing within There's a, a certain chart. obligation to your audience too. Yeah, you know the audience wants to hear those old war horses, mm -hmm. uh, eager an arcade like Eager Beaver and, and some of those dance tunes were things that he really didn't want to play, mm -hmm. but he capitulated because he he uh, he respected his audience enough. And it's also it's good business, you know. You don't want yeah. to alienate your audience. So exactly, yeah. I'm trying to think of who else was I reading about who did that too? Well, a lot of people, but um, well, you know, I, I'm having, having a, a thought here just based on time is we're only up to the seventies in our conversation. Right. I got another 50 years to 40 years to talk about. That's true. And like I've, I've ended up doing here. Uh, would you be possibly open to doing part two at some time in the near future? Yeah, I mean, if uh, if that's interesting, oh, I, find, I, I like talking about it, but I mean. No, uh, we, well, we've got, I'm just going to tell you something. We have a bunch of people on Zoom here. I'd never usually get this many on Zoom and they're staying here. Only a couple have left or maybe they got disconnected. Who knows? Same thing on Facebook. We have a bunch of people watching and the numbers have been, I'm not as well. I do want to reach as many people as possible because there are people very interested in this, and otherwise, I wouldn't be staying here and hanging out. But, uh, um, so let's ask the audience how about part two sometime soon? They're gonna say yes. <laughs> um, no, I'd love to do it. I mean, that's fun. I, you're, you're, uh, this isn't always my most comfortable environment, and you're really good at making it comfortable. So, oh, thanks, man. I, you know, when we were, before we went live, everyone, I was just talking to Gary saying, we'll just pretend we're in Washington or Portland and we're having coffee in a uh -huh. somewhere and we're just having a conversation because this, this is how I would do that. And I've, 
once I stopped trying to be an interviewer, it just went a hell of a lot better. Yes, <laughs> sure. to part two. we got a couple of yeses to part two. So that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. only because uh, I have a couple of things that I need to do and I don't want to go, but I should go in the next five to 10 minutes. And, uh, and then uh, you and I can communicate. I'd love to, com you know, do part two. Yeah, we got a few part two thumbs up. All right. Done yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly do it, man. Even if they like I say, say yes, it's not like I'm there's ready. a lot of gigs I have to make or anything. Or we, I've done one streaming gig since uh, March, no, February. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, a lot of thumbs up for part two. I think that'd be great. Um, so I'll announce that, folks, when Gary and I settle on a time, a day and a time, and uh, we'll do it soon, though. We'll keep the momentum going. This is, I, I really enjoyed this a lot. Oh, me too. Honestly, it's, it's, it's really, and I like the uh, questions too. That's, that's kind of fun. And I'm also very appreciative of the, especially the names that, uh, that I recognize that you read off. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad people tuned in. That's cool. I am too. I'm really happy. I, so thank you folks for signing on and staying on. We've got a lot of uh, people who've been here. This is fantastic. Yeah. And you know, the other thing too, which I sort of mentioned, but I just want to make sure I reiterate is you, you were involved with Stan and this whole history of this, this era and this circle of players in a time frame when I was young, uh, you know, a kid and, and into my teenage years, which was so highly impactful to me that they, these were the, actually in difficult times during my childhood, which really just had to do with going to school because I hated it, is I, this would carry me through. This music would carry me through playing with this music would I play along with Maynard stuff? I play, especially the Maynard from the '60s, with like Tony and Zalico and some of them. Man, swinging charts, you know, and the Kenton oh, stuff, yeah. and the Woody stuff, and the Buddy stuff. Because I wanted to be just like Buddy Rich at the time, you know. Who didn't, right? So, playing, and then you know, Return to Forever came out. But this music carried me through, and so there's a deep connection for me here, which is uh, one of the reasons why it's really nice to have you joining me. Oh. Great. So we have to do part two <laughs> soon. What? Yeah. Yeah, because okay, you guys man. you have so much other stuff you've uh been involved in, you know, with Randy Brecker, uh, George Cables, we mentioned Anito Day, the Seagull, Pete Chris Lieb. I mean the list goes to Bobby Watson, Bobby Shoe, Bobby Florence. I mean, these are all names. I, I just wanna hear some of this stuff. Plus, I want to tap into your mind more about maybe concepts of playing concepts and or ideas in teaching uh because you we know you're a great player and you're a great teacher and it's just nice to hear what what somebody with your level of skill and mastery uh, what happened to that slingerland kit you hauled over to ellensburg ed lynch says got stolen oh geez man that blue sparkle when it was stolen right before i went out with camp and that's why i had to get an endorsement I didn't have any drums. <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez, man. Yeah, sorry. I just switched topics. So bo bottom line is we've got a lot more to talk about. So, well, good. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Total pleasure. Just, All right. Uh, I'd, I'd say we'll figure maybe, out when and I'll. Yeah, maybe in the next couple of weeks we can do. That'd be cool. All Absolutely. Right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching. And uh, this will go. Yes, up. thanks. I'll repost this later as a YouTube link. Um, just got to add descriptions and edit a couple things on the front end. And then, uh, so I'll post it. I'll tag you. Feel free to share it. And uh, of course, the live video will be here to rewatch as much, but you can go to the YouTube link too. And so I appreciate everyone joining in. And Gary, man, thank you. Thank you. It, my friend. Great. All right. We'll talk, today, man. we'll talk later. You got it. I'll be in touch soon. All right. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.